Hello everyone and welcome to Punk Lotto Pod, the game where no one wins. I'm your co-host Justin Hensley. I'm your other co-host Dylan Hensley. And this is the show where using a number generator and the Rate Your Music Punk Charts, we pick one album and one EP at random to discuss. But before we get into the show, uh, how do I? How do you segue into that? Into <laughs> just talking about random shit. How was Richmond? Oh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. Yeah. So, um, yesterday, no, Tuesday night, we got back from our weekend trip to Richmond. We got there Sunday evening, and we stayed. Till about Tuesday afternoon, and um, man, Richmond is a really cool city. Like, yeah, I I love Richmond. I, had I a didn't lot of realize fun there when I went a couple of years ago, and I didn't realize how cool it was because it it kind of reminded me of a little bit Nashville with less people, not and, not as touristy, right? There's yeah, I mean, there's a couple touristy things to do, but it's definitely more of a college city because. Uh, what is it, University of Richmond, or something like that, I don't know the exact name. Um, what, it's like the Virginia Commonwealth? Yeah, it's like smack in the middle of the city, so it's, it, it's got this cool, like, art vibe to it, which explains why they have such a good punk scene coming out of there. Yeah, I, um, it's really, it's just really cool city, because it's got, like, historical districts, and, like, plenty of museums and like um just great the, a lot of restaurants and a lot of just like really interesting places like uh mm-hmm. like a good good shopping neighborhood and like a like a locally local business type street you know yeah it's it's definitely like a punk friendly city too cuz there's like a shitload of vegan options um there's there were i don't know how many music venues there are strange matter just closed but yeah i I believe there's still a decent amount of music venues in richmond and like i said there's all those bands and there's one really really cool record store called vinyl conflict which i didn't get to go to this time but i have been to the one other time i went to richmond to see page 99 but uh that store rules and then I went to another one called Plan 9, where I picked up a copy of uh, the first Brainworms album. It's not really an album. It's like a collection. It's like two EPs together. But Yeah, I didn't actually... I think I maybe walked through one record store when I went. Yeah, I remember getting coffee and like a, some kind of pastry or something at, like a, at a really good coffee shop and in the neighborhood that we stayed in. I'm trying to remember the names of these places, but I can't. It's been a, It's just been a couple years, but... There's like a really cool like a uh, savory pie place, like a New Zealand hmm. pie place. I was gonna recommend that to you, but I figured you probably already had plans. Yeah, everything we chose was just kind of like on the fly. Um, we uh, we wound up having lunch with our friend friend of the show, friend frequent of the pod. F- friend of the pod, frequent uh, fester s- festers, uh, <laughs> John and Kelsey. Um, yeah, we had lunch with them. This place called Eight Two One Cafe, and it was it was really good. They had a ton of vegan options as well. We had an Indian place because where I, where we live, there's no Indian restaurants. So anytime we go out of town, we make sure to get Indian food. We had a pretty solid Jamaican restaurant, and I'm trying to think what else we ate at. Lots of lots of desserts, <laughs> lots of desserts. It, uh, it really reminds me of like kind of like North Carolina's more historic cities like winston-salem and like durham but just bigger and cooler (laughs) yeah more to do generally yeah i did get a um insufficient funds ticket for going through the the (laughs) toll road there yeah we did too yeah we went through one and we were like well we have enough for this one and then there was another one less than a mile away and i was like what the fuck we just paid one like two minutes ago we didn't even change roads like so then the rest of the weekend we got the insufficient funds one and then the rest of the weekend we just made our gps avoid all toll roads yeah (laughs) it it didn't add that it took like 20 minutes to get like the furthest corners away from you know like from each other but it was fine doing that too like it didn't save that much time by taking those toll roads but we spent we spent two days at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. That place is 
fucking huge. Like, the first day we only got to do the first two floors, and then we had to come back the next day to do the third floor. And there's just so much good stuff in there. And the museum is free, which is shocking because of the amount of stuff that you can see in there. Just about every style of art was is featured there. But uh, And then we did the Edgar Allan Poe Museum, which is kind of neat because it, it, it's based around his time living in Richmond, and uh, which is, I believe, I don't know if he died there. I think he died there. No, I don't know. That, well, he's no, buried he, in Baltimore, isn't he? No, he grew up in Richmond. Yeah, his mother is buried in Richmond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why, because it focuses heavily on, like, his childhood. So. Yeah. And there's some really cool artifacts in there, too. Um, yeah, and it's just a really cool city. The entire time we were there, my wife and I were like, whoa, we, we could have spent a week here. Yeah. Very easily. Yeah, it's, it's surprising, too. Like, you don't, I don't know, Richmond doesn't really get talked about. It's not like a, I don't know. It doesn't really get talked about because it's. I don't know. I don't wonder why. The, I wonder if it's just one of those like best kept secret type deals. Like, yeah. don't tell too many people yeah. about it. <laughs> while we were there, um, we were while having lunch with John Kelsey. He he said um, he 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 says it's similar to uh, like Philly, but just way better. And it's like I I could totally see that. I've never been to Philly myself, but there's a lot of hype around Philadelphia and like being a punk and going to Philadelphia to live. Yeah. And I feel like Richmond is the actual better option. I mean, I haven't been to Philly. I I can't say for sure, but Philly has a bad reputation amongst its non-punk community. (laughs) Like it's. Yeah. Our cousin lives in Philly and he works with the, uh, chronically homeless. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, he was telling me there, um, I said something about, I, we both happened to be in town at like the same day, um, mm-hmm. over Christmas break. Um, so it was really funny. We just met up and got coffee and talked and, um, I mentioned something to him. I was like, Oh, you guys just beat out, uh, Phoenix for like the top five, like, uh, population in the, in the U S and he was like, no, not, not yet. We, uh, we're still at number six. Because the murder rate is like really <laughs> high or something. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, I don't know where I saw that. And they must have had the wrong information. But <laughs> well, how would you? How'd your week go? I was. It was pretty good. It's interesting. Um, had a little uh, get together with a drummer in um, the Phoenix area. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was. A long drive to get to him because I had to be there at like six. So I was driving out of Central Phoenix at five o'clock. Uh, so it took a little while to beat beat the traffic to get there, but mm. um, <clears throat> it went pretty well. He was wearing a Jawbreaker shirt. Um, good sign. Which was always a good sign. We talked a little bit and kind of seemed to have you know pretty similar tastes. Not totally overlapping, but like. You know, enough common interests, uh, familiarity, at least. He did say something about, uh, I forget why it came up, but um, he said he went to school with Matt Pryor. (laughs) What? (laughs) I'm guessing college, maybe? Yeah. Or maybe maybe high school, I don't know. (laughs) But um, yeah, and he mentioned uh, some other people, I don't want to name drop, but that were interesting connections of his, so... He seems to be connected to punk and, like, not like a clueless old guy. Just, like, actually does seem to kind of pay attention to what punk is like right now. He didn't say anything problematic, so that was good. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, he he heard your demos, and he already kind of was like, hey, this sounds cool. I could play with this. So, like, hopefully yeah. now it's just, you know, seeing if you guys can communicate on a, you know, bandmate level yeah Uh, we'll see where it goes i'm uh i'm thinking i'm not gonna go i responded to an ad over the weekend for a pop punk band forming in mesa looking for a lead guitarist and i was like well may as well do something while i'm doing nothing yeah and i don't know i don't think i'm gonna go for it (laughs) (laughs) other uh, other developments i got an email from someone called mega jeff x (laughs) <laughs> I play rhythm, guitar, bass, and sing. Here's a link to my old band. I wrote 90% of the music and all the lyrics. I mean, if you're interested in jamming, it's... Would it? 
it's not terrible. Yeah. It's at least actually punk, but yeah, I don't need another songwriter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, unless he just wants to play bass. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's... Uh, I did also see a drummer who posted just the other day, and he linked to a couple of YouTube videos of, like, it was all, it was like a propagandi song, but like a Potemkin City Limits propagandi song. Oh, weird. And like a Bronx song, hmm. a new What Next uh, Hot Water Music song. Yeah, it's okay. And oh, what was the last one? Like a Nothington, like a 2017 Nothington song. <laughs> <laughs> huh. I'm like, he seems to really like the harder stuff, but... You know, if things don't work out with this other guy, he might be worth reaching out to. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, drummers, in my experience, drummers always have weird taste in music anyway. <laughs> like, they have tend to have vastly different taste in music than a lot of the rest of the band. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's because they're listening to music differently than the rest of us, I guess. They're focusing on the drumming, so a lot of times it's like the drumming is what stands out to them the most, and that's what appeals to them. But hopefully be making some real progress soon. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool then. Other than other than that, not much. Working working a lot of six AM shifts this week. Yeah. But. Exciting. I go back to a full work full week of work starting Saturday and I'm like, mm, I don't want to though. <laughs> but oh well. It is what it is. At least I'm not doing overtime. Well, I guess we can get into the show. Let's get into format here. Um, so, using the Rate Your Music charts, we got the year 1978. And on, for our album this week, we got number 10. It is The Saints, Eternally Yours. Yeah! Saints are a R were R R yeah they're still together weirdly uh, are a Brisbane Queensland Australia band. The personnel on this album is Chris Bailey on vocals, Ed Cooper on guitar. I don't know how to pronounce that. K U E P P E R. Cupper Cooper. Cooper probably. Yeah on guitar. Ivor Hay on drums and Algie Ward on bass. Now, Algie Ward actually played bass in The Damned on their second album, Machine or, or that's the third album, uh, Machine Gun Etiquette. I knew that name. Yeah. Uh, he replaced the original bassist for The Saints when the band moved to England <laughs> after their after their first album. So they left Australia and became an English punk band. Right, I guess right at the big boom of punk, which I guess is wasn't a wasn't a bad decision. It probably got a lot, got them a lot more attention. Uh, let's see. I don't think I even wrote down what record label this came out on. That's annoying. Um, I want to say it was an EMI imprint. Hold on. 
Harvest. Yeah, Harvest. Uh, what else came out on it, Harvest? It was released by Sire in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah, I want to say Harvest is an EMI thing, label, for us. Like imprint, maybe, because I read a, in one article it said that EMI told the the record label in Australia to go sign them. Yeah. Yeah, they're an yeah, imprint of Capital Music Group now, originally created by EMI. So, yeah. Yeah. Do we want to uh, talk about the the bigger picture, the full context yeah. of Blunk? Yeah. So, you, you, you want to lay that out? Yeah, because 78 is an interesting right. year. Uh, I I completely had to do the show. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Normally we talk about the year. Why did I forget to do that? That's so weird. I died right into the album. I think uh, because you and I already <laughs> talked about it a little bit right before we... So, yeah, yeah 78, it's like already post-punk. It, it's so weird. Because Why did that happen so quickly? The second Wire record. <laughs> <laughs> the second one. Yeah, Chairs Missing. <laughs> Which the first one was already a post punk album. Chairs Missing is better than Pink Flag. I'm just gonna yeah. say that. <laughs> I don't have enough of an opinion on either one of these. I've listened to them both, but I just don't. I don't have a preference at this. Point. Yeah, I mean, like the the top five is like um, more songs about buildings and food by Talking Heads. Uh, Are we not men by Devo? The Modern Dance by Pierre Ubu. The only good Pierre Ubu album. I don't know. They released two albums that year. <laughs> yeah number four and number six on this chart yeah the only thing in the top five that you would call maybe consider straightforward punk rock is germ free adolescence by x-ray specs and even that is verging on art punk yeah yeah then you've uh then the next one you get is the ramones road to ruin is number eight and then buzzcocks and other music in a different kitchen Anything else super notable? There's well, I mean, there's Love Bites by Buzzcocks too. True, yeah. Um, the first, uh, the Scream. That's the first Susie and the Banshees album, isn't it? Is it the first one? I think so. Give them enough rope by the Clash. The first Public Image Limited. Yeah, yeah seventy-eight. Yeah, Pistols are already over. So good riddance. There's uh, <laughs> a television record in there. Adventure. You got a lot of your also rans i guess i don't know what you would call like stuff like 999 and the, the adverts and yeah the boys it's like they were they were there originally but people don't talk about them the way they talk about the pistols and the damned and the clash and which i, I kind of think is the how with the saints is the same way people don't talk about them the way they should yeah so the saints were the first band outside of the united states to release anything that would be called a punk album yeah um they were still in australia when they released that right their first album i'm the first album i'm stranded yeah it's the yeah the first release outside of the u.s um they beat out the it's first single not album um yeah they beat out the damned and of course the sex pistols um which is crazy because how <laughs> I know they formed because they didn't they see no that's not them I was thinking a different band um yeah like I don't know how they decided to come up with that sound did they hear the Ramones early they like, they must have I mean I I guess the Ramones would have gotten it's crazy that the Ramones would have gotten so much international attention yeah so early on immediately but they did I mean because they like they immediately inspired, you know, everybody, the Clash, the Sex Pistols, the Damned. Like I mean, so I, I would assume it's just the Ramones got played on radio in Australia. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't know enough about the Saints. It's hard to say. There's not a ton of information on them either, like as far as like Well, I I read that they had started as a cover band where they did like Ike and Tina Turner and like Del Shannon covers and the way they started playing faster is that they got nervous in front of crowds, so they just wound up playing the songs faster and faster. So it's almost like they accidentally became punk. Like they just started, they're doing the same type of stuff, like 50s and 60s inspired, like rock and roll, and then started playing it fast, is essentially what it was. Because there's a, there's a, there's a definite, like, R&B 
like classic R and B vibe to this album. I feel like the Saints understood the Ramones way more than the British did. Like they got it. They're like, oh yeah, it's an old thing. Make it faster. It's like essentially it. And the Pistols is like they were doing their version of pub rock, you know, which isn't quite the same. That's probably closer to like Blue Eyed Soul than than you know rock and roll or R and B stuff. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, with the Saints, there's also like a definite proto punk, you know, Stooges, MC Five influence. Yeah. Um. So it almost it almost seems like they kind of yeah came to punk rock simultaneously like they arrived at it independently <laughs> yeah like uh i mean they put the single out before the you know anyone in the uk did so yeah they must have just been taking the same influences that the ramones did which were like you know and they did cite the stooges and mc5 as influences so and and there's like a definitely like a richard hill vibe going on too with this album So when I, I was listening to it, and I was sort of aware of what they sounded like um, before, but li- this is the first like full album I've ever listened to by them. Mm. And I was listening to it, and I was like, "This is Rocket from the Crypt." Hmm. Like this is because on this album they added a horn section. Yeah. Um, who only show up on two songs? Yeah. They, yeah. Unfortunately, and those, but those are the two best songs on the album. Yeah. And those were the two songs I was just like, huh, this is kind of, this seems like maybe this is the idea for Rocket from the Crypt. And I didn't get a chance to research that because I wouldn't be surprised if that was the inspiration. Yeah. Like, uh, John Reese seems like he would, he would latch on to like one thing (laughs) and be like, I want to make a whole band that sounds like that. (laughs) That sound like those two songs on the second Saints album. (laughs) Yeah. But it, but it is. I mean, it's like that loud guitars and snotty vocals and like stacks horns and kind of just like a classic R and B and rock and roll kind of riff writing songwriting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm actually trying to look and see if I can find if there's any connection to the Saints and Rock from the Crypt. Hey, John Reese. Okay. We're not trying to be groundbreaking, Reese said. I hope people won't try to write us off as not being punk because we have a horn player. That would be pretty weak. The Ramones and the Saints used horns all the time. Yeah. So there's definitely... Uh, yeah, there's definitely an awareness. That's from a Desert Times article. Yeah, there's definitely... Oh, those are like definitely the two best songs on the album. And then like um, even the other songs where they try something else, like adding the organ on that one track, Know Your Product. Mm-hmm. That was a really good song. Like it's one of the strong out songs on the album, um, and then like the harmonica on "Rundown" is really good too. And that one's kind of got like a Ramonti sound to it. They kind of have that a little bit of that same sound that the Jam have as well. Yeah, that was gonna that was gonna be the other thing I I wanted to point out. They reminded me of the Jam. Mm-hmm. Kind of in like that because the Jam. You wouldn't really call the Jam a punk band, I guess. 
Yeah. They'd be I a mean, mod rock band. Yeah, they are. Yeah, that's what they are. I mean, that's what they are classified as. I mean, mod rock is like a sp- sort of a spin-off of punk. It, it Well, I mean, I don't know. It's more like The Who, isn't it? True. It's more well, it's almost Who more was of a, a proto punk. The Who was a big influence on punk though, yeah. too. Like punk was a reaction to the more technical prog thing that was going on in rock. So anything that that was like stripped down basics got lumped in with punk. So I guess that's how the jam got thrown in there. They didn't sound like Pink Floyd <laughs> or <laughs> Emerson Lake and Palmer. Yeah. So that's how they got they got lumped in by association, I guess. Yeah, because in in America, a lot of the a lot of the punk bands were you had the Ramones, but then the rest of the punk bands are all just art punk bands. You know, like Talking Heads and Devo, yeah, Pirubu and which Velvet Underground, which I felt like the vocalist in the Saints kind of sounded a little like Lou Reed, definitely less annoying. Right, right, yeah. Like I definitely, oh yeah, I definitely listened to this over any Velvet Underground album, but <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like the Saints are actually pretty underrated. I mean, I say underrated and they're number ten on this chart, but in the greater scheme of punk, they don't really get talked about i mean at least yeah at least from an american point of view who knows maybe maybe in australia they're as praised as um you know the ramones are here and the sex whistles are in england um, i i would have to look into maybe their later stuff to see how much their sound shifted into the 80s because i would be curious to see if they like drastically changed their sound at all and if you know that just kind of like well turns people uh, part off, but they do change their sound quite a bit, but I think that's mainly because both the guitarist and drummer li- left the band mm. uh, after, I believe, Prehistoric Sounds, their third album. So if you look at like the scores on Rate Your Music, those first three are the highest scored, and everything else after that is like, it's got 3.5s and 3.4s, but... I'm Stranded has a 3.85, Eternally Yours has a 3.81, and Prehistoric Sounds has a 3.71. So, there's definitely people who are like, nah, just the first three. That's all that really matters. I'd be curious to actually listen to some of the later stuff. The little bit I sampled wasn't great, but I don't know. I didn't I didn't listen to any other full albums outside of this one. I'm listening to one of these songs really quick, because I'm curious to see how different it is. Yeah, so I... It, I would say it definitely got, um, they definitely got a little more polished and like more acoustic guitars and. Well, I don't know. There are a couple of songs with acoustic guitars on this album too. It's it's funny. Yeah, but they kind of remind me of like the the songs on this album with acoustic guitars remind me more of like those uh, later Wipers records. Oh yeah. Um, which are are really good. Um. But yeah, it kind of has that that feeling to me, and less like mainstream alternative rock use of acoustic guitars. <laughs> yeah, um, there's a couple. I even got a little bit. I mean, this um, this is later. This came out after this album, but like like the acoustic guitars on um, uh, one of these tracks, it um, kind of reminded me of a Husker Du. I think it's just the way it was played. Um, what song is it? Um, God, I'm blanking on the name of the song, but it like you know, and who's could do just some like acoustic guitars that it, it kind of sound like what they were doing on this album, and even even like some of the, I wouldn't be surprised if who's could do were influenced by the Saints as well, because there's a little bit of that wall of sound effect on the you know like the, the guitars have. <laughs> Drunk and fall, and stop the fact 
Yeah, I would think Bob Mould is, I mean, he's definitely aware of the Saints, but I would suspect that he right. is a fan uh, to some degree. It seems like the kind of thing he would like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, you, did you see that um, Springsteen covered the Saints? Yeah, I saw yeah. that. Uh, Just Like Firewood, which is a later Saints song. It's from their, yeah. their 86 album. Um, kind of funny, because I think he did that on the same record where he covered uh, Suicide. Hmm. Uh, Dream Baby Dream. Yeah. It's funny. Like, I guess the right people consider the Saints influences, but just your av- average punk listener may not get the importance of them. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I definitely want to listen to their the rest of their records, their early records. Yeah. You know? And, I, and I'd yeah. probably even kind of work my way a little further into their discography just to see where they go. Because, I mean, I, that song, just like Firewood, is a really good song. Like, the writing is really good. You know? The production is mm. is maybe dubious, but... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's like a little... Yeah, they're one of those bands where it's like they've been around forever. They've released a ton of albums. They've had constant rotating band members and so it's like you never know what's good really once the original lineup is over with and a lot of people don't consider a lot of it good but then like later material i don't know (laughs) who else has this type of career like what the jam (laughs) and like stiff little fingers like they have huge discographies and then like the stuff in the late 80s early 90s is usually considered not very good and then they come back around almost like i don't know um i'd be curious yeah did you did you notice the um the use of the r word on one of the songs on this album i thought that's what it was yeah it's on i wrote it down yeah it's on the song memories are made of this yeah he has the line like you're so retarded yeah it's like ugh like well you kind of ruined this song that would have been one of the better songs on the album well they were australian and it was the 70s yeah (laughs) Yeah. it's hard to get people now to not use that word yeah yeah i uh i didn't get back together with a guitarist because he used that word (laughs) and some variations on it and i'm just like come on you're an adult yeah i mean i figure it out i hear it at work on a pretty regular basis Mm. But, uh, yeah, it's interesting how that... You would never call an actually, you know, a d- disabled person <laughs> that word. Yeah. Yet it's, it's okay to, I don't know, call your friends that. I don't know. The Black Eyed Peas figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, well, any other thoughts on the Saints? Um, no, I... I, I I give this album, I'd give it a 3.75. Some songs are like truly like 4.5, 4.0 tracks, but then there are towards like the back half of the album, there's a lot of like 3, 3.5 tracks. Like it's just like they have some weaker moments on the album. Yeah. But the standout tracks are like really good. Like it's just fantastic. I definitely think they're an underrated, or at least not talked about enough band in the uh, history of punk outside of here's a little known fact yeah yeah (laughs) right the first band to release a punk single outside of the states yeah 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 i'd give it about a i want to give it a four for the really for the best songs just because they're really good yeah um there are moments throughout the album where i get a little distracted and kind of zone out yeah but it's it's, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a little long, but it's almost like maybe a track too long. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing there's nothing on the album that stand, stood out to me as bad. Yeah. So, well, that last song isn't very good. The <laughs> What's that one called? International Robots? Where they're like, the dum do dum 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 dum, 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 dum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't like that song. But, uh, uh, but songs like Australia was really good. New Center of the Universe is really good. The opening track, Know Your Product, is great. Yeah, there's. Yeah, it pro- you know what? Maybe I would give it like a four. That does seem. Looking at it now. Yeah, yeah. I probably would. Hmm. Well. Oh, cool. You want to get into our EP? Our EP. 
Mm-hmm. It's also problematic mm-hmm. a little bit. Mm-hmm. More, mm, more problematic than yeah, I'd say so. Because I don't know too much else on that album that was super problematic besides just the choice in words. Um, and this was problematic at the time. So yeah, but well, okay, yeah, we can talk about. It. We'll talk about it a little more, but yeah. So our EP is number six on the Rate Music chart, and it is Joy Division and Ideal for Living. Three, five, oh, one, two, five, go! I was there in the backstage When this light came around I grew up not a change leg But when the first time around I could see all the weakness Pick all the faults But I can see all the pain tests Just a stick in your throat Free one G Free one G Free one G Hung around in your soundtrack To mirror all that you've done To find the right side of reason To kill the few as for one all the cold facts I can see through your eyes All that's told me no contact No matter how I may try Free on G Free on G Free on G Uh, this was released June 3rd, 1978 on Enigma Records, which was they were, they were owned by Joy Division, which was just a way to release an album. Um, that label wound up changing its name later once they learned there was a label called Enigma, <laughs> which we covered on the TSOL episode, right. didn't we? Wasn't that label? Yeah. So, yeah, they changed that to is it Autonomy Records. I can't remember the name of the label they changed it to. Anyway, uh, this is their debut EP of the... Uh, Manchester English band. So Joy Division was made up of Ian Curtis on vocals, Peter Hook on bass, Bernard Summer Sumner on guitar, and Stephen Morris on drums. And they were one of the million bands who started after seeing the Sex Pistols live. They were originally called themselves Warsaw, which they wound up naming a song on this album, and which was also taken from a David Bowie song, which is like Warsaw's or something like hmm. that. And um Yeah, so Joy Division. Are they as good as everyone No, they can't be. They're not as good as everyone. They're not as good as the first few New Order albums. Yeah. I was gonna <laughs> say I like New Order more than Joy Division. And that's kind of a hot take, but not really. I feel like Unknown Pleasures it's just really important. Like, yeah. it's a good album, and it's really important, and it's really influential. But most people, I think, would probably, if pressed, say that, you know, Movement and Power Corruption and Lies are, are really better records. Yeah, I that that's fair to say. Joy Division are more important than New Order, but New Order are more enjoyable. Because... You know, so this EP, you know, it's their debut, and it doesn't, it doesn't quite sound like Joy Division that everyone thinks of at this point. At this point, they sound just like a really bass-driven '77 punk band. You know, a um, little darker tones, but yeah, the songwriting is very much just in the vein of what everyone else was doing. Yeah. Um... Um, like, if they'd continued this sound, they wouldn't have become the thing that, you know, everyone knows them as. They would just be kind of like a, oh, they'd be f- as regarded as the Saints, probably, or the Adverts, or someone like that. Luckily, they did change their sound, and then also there's the story of Ian Curtis, which, you know, anytime there's a story, there tends to get a little more attention on the the band's. I mean, this was good enough to get them the attention of Factory Records, which signed them and put out their full length. Um, I found some weird facts about this album. So, the initial pressing of a thousand copies were almost unlistenable. 
So the EP is too long for a 7 inch, so they have to compress it to make it fit, and the sound quality degrades way too much, so it, the album winds up being like really muffled and quiet. So they had to, when they repressed it, they had to do it on a 12 inch just so it would have the quality that it needed. And when they released it as a 12 inch, they changed the artwork. Yes. <laughs> Which was a good decision. Yes. So not only is the repress artwork better, it's not problematic. <laughs> so if you have not seen it, and I, I wonder if we should maybe not post the album cover. <laughs> you know, I, I thought about that myself because on the Instagram, I always post the album covers and I am torn on whether or not I should post this ones. It feels like they chose to change it. Yeah. So I feel like, I feel like we should use the 12 inch cover. I don't know. Like I, I sort of understand what they were doing. Oh, I guess we should explain it for people who don't know what it looks right. like. So the the album cover is a drawing of a Hitler youth banging a drum in and it says Joy Division in like sort of Germanic font. Yeah. And so their name is Joy Division. <laughs> yeah, right off the bat. That's problematic. Wait. They have a song called Warsaw. Well, I guess if you don't know what Joy Division is, it's basically um, it's is, is it from a novel? I was reading about that, and I couldn't tell if this was an actual thing or like an actual name. But it's f- at the very least they got it from a novel that does what they call the Nazi sex slaves. <laughs> mm-hmm. so, so that's cool. Yeah, um, it's from a novella called House of Dolls. Yeah. So. Uh, the term Joy Division may have just been in that novel, but it is very much a real thing that they're referencing. Yeah. Um, in order to avoid being killed, you know, some women uh, would offer themselves up for that. Yeah. And then others were just outright taken as, you know, sex slaves. So. And that's such a f- cheery name for your band. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And the cover was drawn by Bernard Sumner. Yeah. And, and and the song Warsaw, mm-hmm, yes, is about Rudolf Hess, right, a Nazi the, who flew to Scotland to try and broker a peace treaty. He was the deputy Führer, yeah, um, which he was supposedly disillusioned with the Nazi ide- ideology. But I'm sure that was just something that he said. <laughs> Yeah, more than likely it was he saw how the war was going and was like, hey, I need to get out yeah. of here. Because, I mean, they locked him up. <laughs> yeah, they, they they knew. Yeah, and the, you know how the song starts off with that 3 5 oh, one, two, five, two, five, five. Yeah. Yeah, it's a reference to Hess's Prisoner of War serial number. Yeah. So... <laughs> So with Joy Division, with the Hitler Youth, with the Rudolf Hess, um, what's the deal with the Nazi shit? I've never understood what, like, 
I feel like they're clearly, like, they're saying these things are bad. Like, I really get that mm-hmm. impression. Like, I don't think they're a Nazi band. No. Like, I feel like they're just... But I've never, I've never understood the the Nazi fascination. A lot of British punks had it. Is it because, I mean, England got hit really hard by the Germans during World War yeah. II. So is it just a matter of it's just pure shock value in the sense that our parents would be so pissed about this? Yeah, you know. <laughs> is it just edge lord humor in in? <laughs> form of a band i don't know because then there are those other ones like when we looked at the subhumans where they were like they had trying to insult nazis by using their yeah yeah i don't know everyone punks punks in the 70s they really they flirted with a lot of nazi symbolism there's a lot of iron crosses on on leather jackets Mm -hmm. and a lot of just fascist imagery Mm -hmm. and i know it was kind of just I feel like to some extent it was like a, it was a shock value thing, but I think to, uh, also to some extent maybe it was intended to be like a, like taking the imagery and symbolism of like the most hardline authoritarianism and like applying it to like a using it when you're like I'm an anarchist. I mean they weren't really most of these punks weren't really anarchists, but you know when you had that anti-authoritarian attitude. What? Yeah, there's that, and then also like accusing like Margaret Thatcher and Thatcherism too of like it's weird because the U in the U S they did it to Reagan like they called him a Nazi all the time and so it's like I don't know I feel like no one had a clear understanding of what they were doing with the Nazi imagery <laughs> so they all I don't know it's like they all wanted to use it but they all had different reasons for wanting to use it i don't know i think it is purely just like i said it's just purely just shock value it's like the true pure reason for using it and then having to then come up with an explanation later like oh shit so people are real mad about this i found an old interview with ian curtis well it would have to Um, be (laughs) they're saying this person's asking um so I'll just start here. What are the lyrics about? I don't write about anything in particular. I write very subconsciously. If they were about anything specific, they would become dated. Yeah, I leave it open to interpretation. Are they trying to hide something? I think to myself as I drop the all-time clangor. When everyone thinks of Joy Division, they automatically think of this Nazi thing. Perhaps it's because of your previous name, Warsaw. What have you to say about that? Uh, Bernard says, We picked Warsaw simply because it is a very nothing sort of name. We didn't wish to be called the somebody. Uh, Back to this Nazi thing, it's good if people can jump to conclusions. I think that people can be very naive sometimes. Uh, People tend to to take a radical viewpoint on everything, whereas if they would would just think for a change, they would see that it was absolutely nothing. Hmm. You wrote in your review that Joy Division still persists in this Nazi history chic. What does that mean? It's a feeling that circulates around your audience, the way you look on stage. They may look dark and mysterious on stage, but why do people connect that with Nazis? Everyone calls us Nazis. No, I didn't say that you were Nazis. I said that you seemed to be interested in Nazi history. Hmm. So they talk. So they talk about Sham sixty nine. Yeah, they never. They don't really. So they didn't even come up with a yeah, reason. They don't really. They're just kind of like. So maybe my trying to justify shock value without seeming like an asshole. I don't know. Like it. Yeah, it just kind of seems like they were like. It looks cool. interested, like maybe just like interested from like a from like a historical perspective, and then just kind of like it just crept into their writing, and I don't know the name. It's just the name and that song and this album cover all together. It's just yeah, it's a little too edgy. Yeah, without much. Of I don't a reason. necessarily. Yeah, I don't think they were like secret Nazi band or anything like that. It's just yeah. It's just trying to be edgy for the sake of edginess, I think. There may be a genuine interest in it. You know, they're from that generation of, you know, kids born after the war, you know, right? I mean, essentially, their parents would have been, or at least grandparents would have been fought in the war. I don't know. I don't uh, It's weird. I don't get it. 
Because when Gigi Allen used swastikas and Nazi shit, you knew exactly why he was using it. I don't think he was like a... He could have been racist, but <laughs> I don't think he was a Nazi. <laughs> I think it was with him, it was just like, I'm shocking, because everything he did was about how shocking he could be. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why they love talking about Nazis so much. The Ramones did it. Lots of other UK punk bands used the imagery at times. I don't know. So, uh, someone someone said uh, accusations of neo-Nazi sympathies merely provoked the band to keep on doing it because that's the kind of people we are. <laughs> Edgelords. So Joy Division are edgelords. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a bummer. <laughs> Tell them to stop doing it, they're going to do it more. They just all have oppositional defiance disorder. Which really makes me think that's entirely what the 77 punk was. <laughs> yeah. Definitely with the Sex Pistols. There wasn't there wasn't enough artistry with what they were trying to do. This will freak out the squares. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And is that why punk has a bad rep? Man, they kind of does have that reputation throughout. When it started in America with the hardcore scene, it was more freaking out the squares. In the 90s, this extreme, coupled with the extreme attitude. Man, it's not until emo gets the soft boys in there that uh, (laughs) punk stops trying to freak out squares. Yeah, I don't know. Because there really is a difference between the punk ethos and punk music in itself. Like, it is a style, but it's also an attitude. Yeah, I don't... I, it makes me really... Anytime we dig into, like, late 70s and early 80s punk, it really makes me thankful that that Ian MacKay exists. <laughs> <laughs> That, that someone early enough on made the DIY thing so intrinsic yeah. to punk and made, you know, and was also, like, not a shitty person. Yeah. And, which, granted, Minor Threat have some also problematic lyrics, but... <laughs> yeah, but I don't think he would write that... He wouldn't he would write that write today. <laughs> guilty of being white today, so... Yeah. <clears throat> that was an, just a little bit of naivete. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, the DC punk scene, it's it really is kind of the model for for all of punk going forward. Like it's the right punk going right. forward. The people still wearing Liberty Spikes today don't quite get the <laughs> Yeah, they, their safety pinning patches to their jackets aren't quite getting they, it. They missed the point, but Yeah. Yeah, the 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 political consciousness and focus and like being actually informed Mm -hmm. instead of just being like i hate the government yeah don't tell me what to do (laughs) (laughs) yeah there there, it is thanks to i guess that is thanks to ian mckay and discord and all the like bands in that scene early on i mean you get buzzcocks kind of doing you know giving you a, a, a different uh approach to masculinity i guess mm-hmm. in punk so there's that and well then you have the women like you have right. um i feel like their stuff aged the best as far as what they were singing about like what the slits and x-ray specs and um who else from but yeah the women in punk i, I feel like the women in punk got it better back then than most of the men they saw what punk could be for yeah, yeah. I mean, they saw just as much opportunity <clears throat> to, you know, like, hey, I, I can play, I can play music and not have to fit into a mainstream conception of of a female pop mm-hmm. singer or whatever. And yeah, definitely did more interesting things <laughs> mm-hmm. that stand time. I mean, you're not going back through like, you know old lyrics of uh you know i don't know i can't think of an example like Susie sue and being like oh well other than her name she, yeah <laughs> right yeah true true a little appropriation <laughs> there but uh <laughs> but right yeah the music and you know her songs and <clears throat> yeah the messages and yeah even like with the what's her name from the plasmatics like she was kind of doing the edgy thing 
But at the same time, it was also more about asserting female sexuality. Right. And so it was edgy and wild, but at the same, but it was also meant something. <laughs> There's a reason behind it. A well thought out. Yeah, you know. Wendy. <clears throat> Wendy Williams. Wendy. Will- yeah, Wendy Williams. Yeah, like right. Like if anyone's gonna do any like wildly sexual, <laughs> mm-hmm. edgy thing, like with punk, it should be it should be women. It should be. We yeah. We've got enough like dudes and cod pieces and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, we don't need more straight white dudes talking about their sexuality. Yeah. <laughs> you had your chance. How about some other perspectives for a change? <laughs> well, what do you want to give this Joy Division EP? So, I give it... You know, I didn't hate it. I enjoyed, no pun intended, some of the music. Um, the song Warsaw is a strong single. Um, I give it a 3.5. Yeah, I would give it about a 3.5 too. Like, it's, like, it's it, a little raw and it's a little like um, generic at times. Mm-hmm. Um, I enjoyed the last song, Failures, a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It really reminded me of they. It kind of they had kind of more of a pub rock sound on that one. Kind of reminded me of like mm-hmm. a, like a Doctor Feelgood, like a, hmm. a British proto punk. But um, yeah, it's nothing amazing. But I never really felt like Joy Division was that amazing anyway. So nah, they were good, good, not great. Always for me. That album cover, um, though. That, I mean, it's some brilliant artwork. <laughs> Whoever came up with that design for that cover. Not n- not the EP cover. <laughs> the Unknown Pleasure. Oh, unknown right, right. Pleasures I thought you were talking cover. about Unknown Pleasure. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was talking about. I just wanted to clarify oh, okay. that. <laughs> Goddamn, that Hitler youth drawing rule. <laughs> yeah. I like the repress cover better. It's just like a black-white photo of some scaffolding. Yeah. <laughs> A very new order <laughs> yeah. album cover. Yeah. And it's true, because it, this cover does not represent the rest of their imagery going forward. You know, like, yeah. A cartoon drawing of a Hitler youth does not match any of the rest of their aesthetic. <laughs> well, what are we doing next week? Well, we're doing a gimmick again. <laughs> I don't, it's, it's weird. I feel like we threw... By not introing the episode like normal, I threw off the the whole flow of this episode. But uh, so we're gonna break, continue that broken flow for the next week's episode, as we're going to to celebrate Valentine's Day. We're gonna do a very special My Bloody Valentine's Day episode, where we focus entirely on shoegaze, um, because because of shoegaze's placement in musical history. It's never gonna. Sh- it's not considered a subgenre of punk, even though I think it should be. Right, because it it doesn't show up in the punk charts on Rate Your Music. So for some reason, their genre trees don't have shoega- shoegaze un shoegaze, shoegaze. <laughs> under <laughs> new wave, which, which is would be what under is an punk. extension of. Yeah, new wave is considered yeah under punk, but shoegaze is not. And I guess it's tied too close to indie rock, which, I don't know, I think indie rock should be included under punk, too. Yeah. I mean, there's more of an argument there, but... Well, yeah. But, yeah, indie rock owes its entire model <laughs> yeah. to punk. <laughs> yeah. And, I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, this way we can talk about some shoegaze. Yeah. Just because we're never going to get a chance to talk about it. And we are fans of a lot of shoegaze bands. And so we just wanted to be able to kind of stretch a little bit outside of our normal boundaries. Um, So what we decided to do, instead of plugging in a year, much like our Halloween spooktacular, uh, we didn't plug in a specific year. We just used shoegaze as rated by listeners in the United States. And on the overall chart for albums, we got number 355. And it is Wild Honey, Sleep Through It. And on the EP charts, we got number 10 with Slow Dive and their EP Morning Side. So I'm actually very excited to talk about both of these. Um, yeah. Yeah. That'll so. be fun. Yeah. So continue to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We're at Punk Lotto Pod. Um, we have an email address. It's punklottopod at gmail.com. 
And we have a website. It's punkladderpod.simplecast.fm. Uh, all our episodes are available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Play. Uh, and even various other like uh, podcasting sites. So if if it's not on the one that you prefer, let us know. And we'll, uh, we'll check and see what we can do about that. Um, yeah, otherwise, please rate, review, and subscribe. Um, I did not come up with any good ideas for clips in this one, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop recording. All right. But now I'm realizing that this painting is making us all crazy. Crazy! Hey, there's painting! The key to the Holocaust, Ryan Gosling playing you? Ridiculous. This has to end now, and so I have the final solution. I'm going to burn this painting, and you can't stop me. We won't. What? Dude, if that's not an original Hitler, then who gives a shit? Yeah. Oh, yeah, all right. Do you like my whole, my whole thing I was doing there? <laughs>